So first of all, I want to, uh, this is what we're going to go through. So I'm going to go through a little bit first on um, uh, the data and where the data goes. And then we're going to um, tell you a little bit of the workflow, talk about the main considerations of next generation sequencing in terms of what flavour of next generation sequencing you do, depending on what problem you want to solve. And then we're going to talk about standards, storage and interpretation of the data, especially in a clinical context. So let's talk about data requirements. So let me first put this in context. So this is from a, a PLEOS paper that makes projections of uh, big data uh, requirements in 2015 in context of astronomy, Twitter, YouTube, and us over here in genomics. Now to give you a feel for the numbers, we all know what a megabyte is. A gigabyte is 1,000 megabytes. A terabyte is 1,000 gigabytes. We all have terabyte drives. Now a petabyte is 1,000 terabytes. And an exabyte is a thousand uh, petabytes, right? <laughs> so, so terabyte, <laughs> I've got lost myself. So a petabyte is a thousand terabytes, exabyte a thousand petabytes, and a zettabyte is a thousand exabytes. So a petabyte, so upstairs in the seventh floor we have a, a very large uh, computing facility with two and a half thousand CPU cores. It has a petabyte of storage, so that's a, that's a pretty sort of fancy uh, machine, and a petabyte is, you know, doable, but it's, it's quite, a, quite expensive. First of all, in terms of storage, you can see that the storage between Twitter, YouTube, and genomics are actually fairly comparable. So genomics has going to have data requirements of these very large uh, data, data, uh, data, data users themselves. The main difference is, is how the data is processed. Astronomy, they generate lots of data, but they process it very quickly and throw a lot away and only keep the good stuff. Twitter, there's lots of small bits of data coming in slowly, and you don't have to process that, and it's very quick to process, and it's not very complicated to process. YouTube is going to get 500 to 900 million hours of video every year, but you only need to uh, store that, and you don't need to analyze it very much. You just need to be able to give it to people at a certain rate. Genomics is a very heterogeneous source of data, depending on what type of sequencing you're doing and how you analyze that sequencing data. So this is very different. And this, in a sense, takes a lot of CPU time to do, to do itself. So where does this uh, information come from? Well, this is uh, historically, so here we are at 2015, and this is uh, data usage at the NCBI um, um, short read archive, which stores a lot of uh, the worldwide genomic information. Currently, there's about three and a half petabytes of data in it, corresponding to about 250,000 human genomes. Here we are at 2015. By 2025, the trend is going up here into the zettabyte domain. Illumina suggests this is the trend, and this is Moore's Law. So Moore's Law is a doubling of data uses every two years. So uh, as you can see, we're heading into this, uh, this uh, incredible territory of uh, the amount of genomic data we're going to have. So let me put that data into context of the workflow, because this is quite important. So Matt talked to you a little bit about um, the next generation sequencing workflow, and I've just sort of simplified it here. There's a library preparation stage where you shoot up the DNA, and you put it on a sequencer. The sequencer makes things called the FASTQ files. These are those raw little tiny sequence reads. You then need to align them to the genome, and those little sequence reads are then stored in something called a BAM file, a binary alignment file. Then you need to genotype these little reads, and those genotypes can be put in a format called a VCF file. So this is really genomic location, what's going on with that like, genomic location information. Then you need to annotate that information to make sense of it. Is it in a, is it in a, uh, in a gene? Which gene? Um, and then you need to make a sense of it. Is that mutation um, uh, pathogenic? And can you do something about it? So this is where all that data requirements come from. If you're going to do panel sequencing, you're talking about a gigabyte of information here, an exome about 12 gigabytes. And if you're doing a whole genome, you're talking about 100 gigabytes of information. If you're smart, you can take this information and make sure it all ends up in the alignment file. So you don't have to double your data, which, which is fortunate. But at this point, after you genotype it, the information is much smaller and much more tractable. And this is the, this is the, you know, the high value data. It's complicated by the fact that lots of different people use lots of different methods to generate this information. So this is the heterogeneity of that, that data. So the data storage, which I tried to frighten you with, is dominated by this raw sequencing data. You can compress it using fancy techniques. You can drop it down by about a factor of 
But really, you might have to do what the physicists do. You might have to only keep the high value data when the cost of resequencing becomes less than the cost of storage. Okay? So this is my, I think this is where the future will have to be when you start getting into the zeptobytes information. So what sort of sequencing uh, should you do? And uh, I want to talk about that briefly. So, and it's a very simple concept of measurements of false negatives and false positives. Okay? So false negatives, that is, there's a mutation there, but you missed it, is generally the primary factor for false negative is sequence coverage. You didn't have enough of that sequence read over the location where that measurement could be made. The other part is a bioinformatic problem, my problem, and that's algorithm sensitivity. It wasn't sensitive enough to find it. False positives abound in next generation sequencing data. They come from a line of artifacts because you have pseudogenes and low, low complexity regions in the human genome where your reads are multi-mapping to. The reads themselves have, have errors in them due to the technology which generates them. So Illumina reads have many more errors in their fire prime end. And also algorithm specificity as well. So false positives and false negative solutions. Well, you can control for false positives using quite sophisticated statistical methods to post-filter your genotype data. And you can also use customized algorithms to try to get rid of these false negatives. We uh, use slightly different approaches as well. We utilize large cohort sequencing. So we've uh, genotyped several thousand people upstairs. And what we do is we, when we're analyzing one person, we won't genotype just one person alone. We'll genotype that person with hundreds of other control samples. And then we use this information for our false positive detection by detecting batch effects due to sequencing and the, the technology. In cancer sequencing, we use this control cohort to increase our sensitivity as well. So we can have lower coverage but still have better sensitivity by using this large cohort methods. So in cancer sequencing, this is particularly important. So here's a, here's a piece of tissue and imagine these red cells here are a cancer. So you can imagine if you have this sample here, you know, a small amount of cancer in this, in this, uh, in this tissue of normal tissue. This is a low tumor, tumor density sample. This is a high tumor density sample. You're going to need a lot more sequence reads to find this guy. Okay? So if you need lots of coverage, panel sequencing is great because it will give you lots of sequencing reads over a particular location. However, it only gives you a small number of locations, maybe 50 genes or 50 exons or exons in 50 genes. Exome sequencing will give you all the protein coding ranges of the genes, but an expense of some coverage. Whole genome sequence will give you the whole works, but once again, your coverage is going to be smoothed out. So in terms of bang for your buck, you need to spend about $4,000 to get a, an 80x whole genome, where an exome you're talking about $800. So there's a certain bang for your buck, and between panel and exome, you have to consider, well, how often will I have to update my panel? So at the moment, um, um, companies in the States are telling me who do panel sequencing or updating their panels every three months because new genes keep coming out and new discoveries. So we tend to sit in this area here with exomes, and there's a number of private companies like Personals that do the same thing. Their, their sequencing is based on exomes as well. Right, data standards and validation. So um, um, there are... Um, standards out there, and uh, there's NATA, there's the Royal College of Pathologists and Human Genetics Advisory Committee. These two, these groups have got together called the and have a PathWiki project to write down standards for next generation sequencing. Now they're not rigorous standards. They're um, because next generation sequencing has so many different flavors and there's so many different algorithms. There, there are general guidelines for how you should uh, test and validate these methods, and I'll get to that in the next slide. There's also many international efforts as well. So we've recently gone through this process and have NAR approval in our lab. A general feel is for what all these standards are about is one is developing an assay. So this is sequencing, if you like, for DNA. And then you need to validate that assay by saying, well, I've done all this sequencing on x ray and whole genome, but what's the sensitivity, specificity? Is it reproducible? So this is the um, test validation process which we have to go through and report. Now, for exomes and genomes, it's different for every position in the human genome. So it can be a little bit more complex, but it's, it, it is tractable. And then there's testing it on real people. And we've gone through and done this uh, on, a, on a number of projects. So for part of our compliance for this sequencing step, we have multiple DNA steps along the way. 
these sort of steps here were about checking the, equip the sequences working correctly and did you get as much reads as you would expect. When you align them, you want to check, well, I expected the exome. Did my reads align to exomes? So this can check for contamination. We also have uh, additional QC steps after genotyping. Because we do large cohort sequencing, we can do identity by descent calculations and compare every sample to every other sample. That enables us to can check for contamination of any sample. We can get identify the relationships between all the samples. So if you have parents and children, you can verify uh, the relationships there. If you have multiple samples from a cancer patient, you can check they are all from the same cancer patient. We also check for gender and ethnicity as well. So ethnicity doesn't uh, affect treatment, but it does affect in subtle ways how you might analyze the data. Uh, so then we have a large gold standard cohorts, which we solved over the years, which are uh, which uh, we run through our pipeline whenever we make a change to make sure we get the same answer. And also we use this pipeline for assay development as well. So part of that is the interplay between research and the clinic. So over the years we've built up a very large cohort of AML, which is a type of uh, um, acute myeloquema, so this is blood cancers. So in collaboration with PA Pathology, South Australian Pathology, Andrew who's speaking, we've got a, a, a huge cohort of these samples. It's not just the samples, we have detailed pathology on every one of these samples. And we've collaborated with Andrew Way down in Monash to do sequenome sequence, which is a different sort of sequencing technology to get uh, all the um, clinically relevant point mutations in these samples. Additionally, 137 of these have been whole genome sequenced for us, so we can do a very tight validation of, of the findings that for these uh, cancers. We also have thousands of controls that we can comply our methods to, to to look for our false positives. So this is an example. The FLT3 ITD is an important mutation in these cancers and it is druggable. And what we've shown using our methods is that given the tumor genicity, this is a measure of tumor genicity. So say there's only 5% of the cancer cells in the, in, in the blood then we would need 100 reads to detect a FLT3 mutation. And that's about uh, a clinically relevant area. So this is tractable of exomes. If you needed to check uh, much less tumor density samples, then you would need to have three or 400 fold coverage over this region of the genome, which would be a panel sequencing. Okay, so really the flavor of the sequencing you do really is affected by the, by the clinical, uh, uh, what you want to do in the clinic. We also have a very large uh, cohort of 100 uh, squamous cell carcinomas where we're using a very fancy pack bio machine to do ultra accurate um, PCR, digital PCR measurements. So we've used our algorithms to find uh, genotypes in very low tumor samples and we validate and test those using uh, an alternative technology. So storage and sharing, this is a bit of a uh, um, the power, of course, in doing this is that you can connect genotype to phenotype information and share that information with others so you can have cohorts large enough to make discoveries. So you need a connection between genotypes and phenotypes, and to do that you need ethics and data security. You also need a standardised vocabulary so you can share your data with other people. And you also need ways of transferring large data sets. So there are many international efforts of standardized way of storing sequencing data. This is our own commercial database we've had for many years. It has about 20 billion uh, variants in it and several thousand samples. So, and it's on a regular machine. It has uh, very high data security so we can store phenotypes and genotypes in this database. So interpretation and reporting. So, We've done a lot of work collaborating with PA Pathology here on developing clinical report structures. So a clinical report has to go to pathologists because only pathologists can give an interpretation of, of, of the data. So we're building our report structures to work with pathology. Um, so this is relatively straightforward if you know what you want to measure. So I want to measure these genes and these mutations and these genes. So this is the report structure we've, uh, which we generated. But of course, personalized measure, you want to go further than that. You want to find different mutations that might be druggable. So in that sense, you need to also get variants of clinical importance and actual variants. And there are worldwide efforts to do this. So there's the, uh, 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 this particular database here called the uh, Data's Database of Consensus Mutations, which uh, only reports variants which are druggable. 
or are prognostic markers for disease, because we're not just looking for things that might be druggable, we're looking for markers which might tell you this patient uh, needs a more aggressive form of chemotherapy. This great database over here matches genes to drugs which affect those genes. And it can, so there's this particular database combines together 14 other databases to give you a one-stop repository to look for that information. And these are only two of the sort of projects. But these are the sort of things you need to key into to turn your list of variants into actionable data. So why is everyone doing this? Well, uh, and what do I mean everyone? So England and Saudi Arabia have both announced they're going to sequence 100,000 samples. US and China uh, both announced that they will sequence over a million of their citizens using um, next generation sequencing. Indeed, there's projections that by 2015, 25% of individual and developed nations will have their genomes sequenced. And as, and as a, uh, many sort of reports suggest that the reason people are doing this is because this McKinsey report, for example, noted that the US healthcare could create $300 billion in value from each year by using this big data and linking uh, genotype and phenotype information together. The important part, I think, for us is that two thirds of that saving is from reducing US uh, healthcare expenditure by using appropriate testing and not doing things you don't need to do. Uh, and I think that concludes my, my talk.